The first topic for today is we are redeemed from a defiled conscience. We are redeemed from a defiled conscience. And so what we want to look at here is we're going to look back in, in the law, in the book of Hebrews, we're going to look back in the law and see how it was worthless. And then we're going to look forward to what Jesus has done and see how it's a much better thing. Okay, so when we truly lay hold of Jesus's finished work of redemption from sins, then our conscience will be purified and the remembrance of sin is washed away. We can have peace of mind and the shame and guilt of past sins is gone. The shame and guilt is washed away by the blood of Jesus. Okay, so I, I can just think of myself, for example, before I was born again. In fact, twice, oops, twice I almost committed suicide um, because, well, first of all, I was using drugs, uh, so that didn't help. But um, it, as I was in this addiction, the thing that was constantly plaguing me, I was just kept remembering all the terrible things that I had, I had done. And I was just so filled with shame and I just wanted to kill myself and get it over with. Uh, I mean, it was just just pure and utter shame. And I was just be crying on the floor and just begging God to forgive me and, you know, stuff like that. So I had a, a severe remembrance of sin. There was I was not experiencing any forgiveness at that point in time. Of course, I wasn't born again yet either. And so just think about all the unborn again people around us in life. You know, they they have that remembrance of sin. You know, that's why so many people are addicted to certain things or have certain addictive behaviors, you know, even if it's not drugs or alcohol, but, but people are looking for something to kind of cover up that pain when they think about what they've done wrong in their life. And even though like some of us may think we've done worse things than other people have, I would, I would bet that almost everybody's having that same kind of guilt feeling, even if they weren't a, a murderer or something drastic as we might think. I think most people are still plagued by their past sins. Okay, so when we read in Hebrews, we'll see that, you know, the, the Old Testament, the old law and all the sacrifices and things they did, um, it it couldn't it couldn't wash away that guilt. Okay, so let's read this. So in Hebrews chapter nine, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is not of this creation not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered into the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Okay, so there's a lot going on here. So first of all, um, Jesus redeemed us. And this is yet another redemption word. So there's, I think we've seen like four or five of them by now. Um, so this one is lutrosis. And this is a ransoming, a redemption, deliverance, especially from the penalty of sin. So always remember that you're ransomed from an enemy. Okay, so somebody has to... Take a prisoner in order for a ransom to be there. So if you kidnap somebody's child, then you know that, that kidnapper is going to say, hey, if you pay me the, my ransom money that I want, then I'll let your, your kid go. Or if you're in war with somebody and they capture some prisoners and maybe they want you to make a ransom payment to release the prisoners. So a ransom is always paid to an evil party. You know, you never pay a ransom to a good party. So Jesus is not redeeming us from mean, wrathful Father God. Jesus is redeeming us from the devil because we were his captive. We were his slave. You know, we were taken into bondage by the devil because of sin and even because of law and curse. Okay. So, so first of all, Jesus did redeem us. You know, he ransomed us back from the devil so that we belong to him and we belong to father so that we are now in father and Jesus's authority and no longer in the kingdom of darkness you know, under the authority of the devil. So we have been ransomed from the devil, rescued from him, redeemed from him. Okay, so now what he's saying here is he says that I lost it. Actually, I'll tell you what, let me read this next passage and then I want to come back and talk about this one because they kind of go together. So in, in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, 
can never, with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, like the days after the law, like after Jesus comes. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. And then it goes on to say, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Okay, so um, what it says in chapter 10 is it says that, you know, according to the law, there's a reminder of sins every year. Okay, so every time, like every year, they'd have to go make certain sacrifices, and, and so they're constantly reminded of all their sins. You know, they have to think about it. They have to do the right sacrifice to, you know, atone for their sins or whatever. But the problem with that is it, it does nothing for you because all it does is bring to your remembrance continually those sins that you've done. I mean, and some of us, we, we didn't even need a reminder of sins. It was just there naturally, you know, but even more, these people were forced to remember their sins because they had to do these sacrifices. So even people that might not have been inclined like I was to remember my sins, even they would have to remember their sins under this law. Okay, so there's this constant reminder of sins. And when you have this constant reminder of sins, then you have all the associated problems. You have shame, you have guilt, you have weakness of faith, you have depression, fear, anxiety, um, feelings of worthlessness and helplessness, you know, feelings of despair. So that you could just go on and on with that list. You know, when you remember your sins, you're not in a good place, you know, unless unless you're on the other side of it, like if you're on the victory side and you've overcome something through God, you've overcome sin, then you can remember and you can, you know, put it in the context of, man, I used to be so bad, but thank God, you know, he transformed me and now I'm completely free from that. Okay, so all that Old Testament law couldn't perfect anyone. You know, it, it says that, it, it says through those sacrifices, it could make, it could make no one perfect, you know, it can never make those who approach perfect. And that the constant reminder of sins. Okay, but with Jesus, our conscience is cleansed by his blood. Like there's like a miraculous thing that happens. You know, so when I was born again, it, it wasn't 100% for me at first, but when I became born again, I was instantly made a new creation. I wanted to stop sinning. I had the ability to do it. And um, so that was really strong in me. And then I still had some problems with some remembrance of some particular sins, but I was like extremely better instantaneously. And then what we have to do is, you know, if someone is still experiencing some kind of remembrance of sin, we can be completely free from that. Okay. And so think about verse 17 here. So God himself says, their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Okay, so God is not remembering our sins. He's like, you know, there's another scripture that says, your sins and lawless deeds, he has removed from you as far as the east is from the west. You know, so and he says, I will remember your sins no more. So if God is not remembering our sins, then who are we to remember them? Okay, who are we to remember our sins? There is one person who does want us to remember sins, and that one's the devil. And let me read, from my notes here, I'm going to read Revelations 12, 10. It says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Okay, so it's Satan who is the accuser of the brethren. It's Satan. He's the one who's bringing to our remembrance our sins. And so what do we do about that? You know, Jesus paid for our conscience to be cleansed. I mean, that means no more guilt, no more shame, no more remembrance, no more being plagued by your past. I mean, that is paid for by Jesus. Freedom from your past is paid for by Jesus. Um, but yet the devil, he's sitting there trying to keep you feeling guilty. Because if he can make you feel guilty, then you're weak in faith, you're ineffective in faith, 
your relationship with God is hindered and all kinds of other side effects like we just talked about, depression, anxiety, all those things. Okay, so the devil would like to keep us in bondage to our past. But if we, we need to know it's God is not reminding us of our sins. We need to know that if God is not remembering our sins anymore, then that means that we are entitled to not remember our sins anymore. And we should not because it's not helpful unless you're giving a testimony of victory to someone else, right? Okay, so if you are having this remembrance, recognize that it's from the devil. And then, then what you want to do is you want to cast down those thoughts. You want to confess that your sins are washed away. You want to confess that you will remember your sins no more. You want to confess that you're holy and blameless and above reproach in the sight of God. And so any of the scriptures that are like that, you want to confess them over yourself. And then, of course, you want to thank Jesus for what he has done. And when you do that, then that guilt, boom, it's going to be gone instantly. I promise you, guaranteed, 100% guaranteed. Amen? And so that that you can apply that tactic. If there's some sin from a long time ago that's bothering you, then do this. You know, if there's some new sin that you commit, then do the same thing. You know, anytime there's remembrance of sin, guilt or shame, we want to just take advantage of what Jesus did. You know, he paid a price to ransom us from the devil. He paid a price so that our conscience can be cleansed. He paid a price so that we need not be reminded of our sins any longer, like the law reminded people of their sins. So he paid a price so that we can be completely free from that. Amen? So the work that he did isn't just so we can go to heaven, but it's so that we can have peace in our souls, peace from all that sin plague that was plaguing us. We can have peace now. So it's really good. Okay? So let me just see if I can uh, come up with an example here. Okay, so let's just say that there's something from the past that I did and I'm feeling guilty about it. Um, okay, so the first thing I do is I recognize it's the devil. Okay, and, and what did Jesus do when the devil when the devil was messing with them? He was, you know, he would say, "Away with you, Satan!" For it is written, "Amen." Okay, so here's what I would do. All right, so in the name of Jesus, Satan, I command you and your condemnation. You leave me and you leave right now. I declare in the name of Jesus that my sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus. I declare in the name of Jesus that God shall remember my sins no more. Therefore, I will not remember my sins. I declare that my sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus. I declare that I have been refreshed, renewed, and regenerated by the Holy Spirit. I declare in Jesus' name that my heart has been sprinkled clean from all evil conscience, from all evil remembrance, by the blood of Jesus, and I will remember my sins no more. I declare in the name of Jesus that my sins have been removed from me as far as the east is from the west. My sins have been removed from me and will be remembered no more. So Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you washed away my sins, not only so that I can go upstairs when I die, but also so that I have freedom and peace in my heart every day of my life without the guilt, without the shame. Jesus, I thank you that you bore all shame and all punishment for me, so I am free from shame. I am free from guilt. I am free from this plagued conscience. So thank you, Jesus, that by your work, my conscience is clean and clear right now. Amen. Okay, so if you do something as simple as that, then boom, that guilt and shame and evil remembrance, it will depart from you. Amen. Okay, so uh, one other thing I wanted to point out. So on this page, what all do we see that we're redeemed from? Well, first of all, we see that we're redeemed from, uh, from law and curse. We're redeemed from sins. We're redeemed from transgressions. And a transgression, a transgression is a breaking of the law. So anytime a law is broken, that is a transgression of the law. Okay, sin would be a broader um, transgression is specific to the law. Okay, we're also redeemed from these worthless sacrifices that people were doing. We're redeemed from defiled conscience. In other words, we're redeemed from guilt and shame and remembrance of sin. Okay, so we have a very big, huge redemption that Jesus has paid for. Okay, the other thing I wanted to point out is, you know, the Bible has a lot of, you know, types and shadows in it. And... And we could debate about the law and various things about it. 
But just know this, the law is just a shadow of good things that were to come through Jesus. Okay, it's the law was not the very image of things of God. The law is a shadow of things of God, of things of Christ to come. Okay, so always think of of types and shadows. Okay. And so in the Old Testament, you'll see something, and there's something to learn from what you find in the Old Testament, but it's not necessarily the very image of something from God, but it's like something from God. Okay, so there are things that we can see in the law that point to something good to come with Christ. All right, so let's go on. Okay, so on this page, we are redeemed from like sinful nature, and we are redeemed, therefore, to live holy and to do good works. So through Jesus, we are redeemed from sin and sinful nature. We are made into new creations. We are made into sons of God. We are made to be kings and priests, and we are filled and anointed with the Holy Spirit. So by way of the Holy Spirit, we partake of the fruit of the Spirit, which includes self-control. So we are to exercise self-control, to live sober, obediently, and holy. Additionally, because we are redeemed from sinful nature, we now have a righteous, which means a do-right or do-good nature, which makes us zealous for good works. So let your good works abound. Christians are often frustrated and unfulfilled due to not fully acting upon this desire of the Spirit who dwells in us. Okay, so we get a change of spirit when we get born again. Okay, so before we were born again, we had a sinful nature. We had the nature of the devil, and we liked sin, and we were immersed in it, and we were always selfish, self-centered. You know, that's the nature of a person who's not born again. Okay, but when you become born again then that sinful nature, it's its dead and gone. The old man was crucified with Christ. Okay, And when the Bible says the old man, it's referring to the sinful nature that we once had. So the old man crucified with Christ, or through baptism, it dies in baptism. The old nature, the sinful nature, when you go under the water, you die with Christ. That sinful nature is dead. And then when you come out of the water, you're raised to newness of life as a new creation, a son of God, a king and a priest. Okay, so when we are born again, we literally get a change of spirit and we receive the Holy Spirit. And well, guess what? He's holy. So we have a desire to do good, a desire to live right, because we have a Holy Spirit. And, and so that Holy Spirit inside of us wants us wants to live sin free. You know, so we get a change in nature about our about the behaviors that we want to participate in. Um, but also we get this burning desire to do right and do good things for other people. And whereas before we were more selfish and self-centered, um, now we want to now by way of the, the Holy Spirit, we are more outwardly oriented where we want to be helpful to other people because we have a love for them, you know, the love of the Holy Spirit. So we have this burning desire inside of us by way of the Holy Spirit to be constantly doing right and doing good things. And a lot of people, a lot of Christians feel unfulfilled. You know, a lot of Christians just, they feel like there's something missing. And I think probably the number one thing that's missing from a lot of Christians' lives is we haven't figured out how to put into practice all the good works that the Holy Spirit inside of us wants to do. You know, so we feel unfulfilled, like we want to do something. You know, I want to do something good. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. You know, there's that desire inside of us to do good things. And maybe that's another teaching that we could do. But I encourage you to be seeking an outlet for good works because that is where that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do, first of all. And then not only does the Holy Spirit want us to do that, but there's something inside of us that like longs to do good works. And plus there's blessing for the person that we help, then there's a return blessing for us for helping others, plus it's accomplishing the will of God, so that it's just all around good. And you can find various things to do. You could feed the homeless. You could volunteer and help people. You could do kind deeds to people. You could heal the sick. You know, there's so many things you can do. And, and you can do things from afar, and you can do things in person. And I would encourage that you have like a balance of them, because Sometimes we get hung up like just doing remote works, like maybe we're supporting ministries and helping people in Africa. 
which is great, but then, but then it's not as satisfying as doing something live and in person, you know? So like when you can actually literally touch and help a human being face to face, it's like super rewarding. Amen. And we want to do the far away things because they need to be done. Um, but we also want to have some interaction face to face because that's going to even be um, very helpful for our own soul. Okay. If we read in first Peter 13 and 19, he says, therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. And if you call on the father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Okay, so again, we have been redeemed. And this, this word is lutruo, which is yet another one. And lutruo means to release on receipt of a ransom, to redeem, to liberate by payment of a ransom. Okay, so again, Jesus paid a ransom to buy us out of the devil's authority, to buy us out of the, king, uh, the devil's kingdom, and to bring us into Christ, to bring us into the kingdom of God. Okay, so Jesus has redeemed us from the devil's kingdom and brought us into his kingdom. So we have been rescued from the devil's kingdom. But not only that, we have been rescued from that unholy nature that we used to have. Right. So now we have a new nature. And now we um, one of the fruit of the spirit is self-control. And we have to lean on that fruit of the spirit because we our flesh may still be inclined to want to do certain ungodly things. And we have to conquer that. Um, and we have the power to do so by the presence of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. So because Jesus redeemed us from that sinful nature and from the devil's kingdom, because of that, we have the ability and the expectation to live holy. Now, um, we, we probably have not lived up to that perfectly, but let's seek to continue to become increasingly perfected in, in this calling. Okay, so we are called to be sober. We are called to be obedient. We are called to be free and stay free from the former lusts and sinful desires that we once had. We are called to be holy in our conduct. Okay, so um, Jesus paid for that. We have a new nature. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the ability to, to live holy if we will lean on the Holy Spirit and, and seek to do our Father's good will. Okay, in, in Titus 2.11-14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. Okay, so again, um, this is very much like the passage in Peter. So we have been redeemed, and this is the same word, lutero. Um, we have been liberated by payment of a ransom. So we have been liberated from the devil's kingdom. We have been liberated from the sinful nature that we once had, that ungodly nature, that lustful nature, that selfish, self-centered nature. We have been liberated from that. That old man has been crucified with Christ. Okay, and so now we are called to live soberly, live righteously, meaning living right, doing good things, live godly in this present life because Jesus paid the price so that we can do this. And we have been purified, you know, from all the sins, past, present, and future. We have been purified by Jesus, by his blood. And so now we have this new nature and the new nature is zealous for good works. Amen. So the sinful nature has been replaced with a new nature that wants to do good works. And that's why it's so important to find an output, like an outlet for that good work that, that the spirit inside of you wants to do. Okay. 
So it was no problem as for us finding sinful things to do in times past. Now we need to take that same zeal that we once had for sin, and we need to have that zeal and do good things instead. Amen? Okay, we have also been delivered from shame. In Romans 10, 11, it says, For the scripture says, Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Okay, so again, the way salvation works, the way redemption works, is Jesus suffers something, and then we get a freedom and a benefit because of what he suffered. So in this case, Jesus was put to shame so that anyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. So let's just look at some of the shameful things that happened to Jesus. So this isn't a complete list, but it's a pretty good one. So Matthew chapter 27, verse 27 to 31. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. And then going on to verse 39 through 44. And those who passed by blasphemed Jesus, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, Save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is the King of Israel, let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Okay, so th these are just some of the things, these are some of the ways Jesus was put to shame, but it's not, I mean, there were even more ways than this. So first of all, there's a whole group of people, a whole garrison of soldiers around him, and they stripped him naked. I mean, just imagine how humiliating that is. So they stripped him, and then, you know, they, um, they put a crown of thorns on him. So that's humiliating. Of course, it's obviously painful, but it's humiliating as well. And then they're mocking him. They're spitting on him. They're striking him, uh, more mocking, you know, and then being crucified. That's like, that was the most shameful and torturous way to die back in that day. So the most dreaded punishment was to be crucified because typically it was a slow death that could take as long as three days. You know, in Jesus's case, it was a matter of hours, but typical, typically it would be as long as three days. And so you're suffering very badly, hanging on the cross with terrible pain, humiliation. People are walking by, mocking you, saying things, spitting on you. You know, it's just extremely shameful, extremely torturous. And Jesus bore that um, for us. Amen. And he was constantly being blasphemed. They're, you know, shaking their head at him, wagging their head, mocking him, reviling him, saying bad things to him. So, you know, this was just a tremendous amount of shame that Jesus went through went through, and yet he was innocent of all things. So he suffered shame on our behalf so that we are redeemed from shame. Amen? We are redeemed from shame. Whoever believes in Jesus will not be put to shame because Jesus suffered shame for us. Okay, so, you know, I always like to get the maximum benefit that I can out of a scripture. And so things have happened in life not very often, but sometimes things will happen where there's opportunity for shame. Okay, and, and in my case, there's a couple examples from work, and one of them was really bad. So I had, you know, I was uh, like inventory manager at the time, and I had a spreadsheet, and on the spreadsheet, I had um, what well, just inventory information. And then I was in some email, and I just I copied something, and it was like it was from HR, and it was related to to layoffs, actually. And I copied that information and I need some place to paste it. And I just temporarily just stuck it on a tab in this, in this worksheet, this inventory worksheet, just because I just need some place to paste it. And it was just a, a dumb thing to do. Well, anyway, later that day, somebody asked me, Hey, can you send me the, the inventory spreadsheet? And so I sent this to two people 
And it had this, it had this information about people that were going to get let go in there. I'm like, when I realized that, I'm like, oh my God. And I'm like, Father, <laughs> the Bible says that whoever believes in Jesus will not be put to shame. So I declare in the name of Jesus, I will not be put to shame as a result of this snafu with this, um, having this HR information in this embedded in this file. I will not be put to shame. And so then I sent a message to the two people I sent it to. I'm like, please immediately destroy that email. Do not look at it. Um, I've made a mistake, you know, just destroy it. And, and this was like hours later in the day and both the people I sent it to, you know, I, I believe them, you know, they, they said they destroyed it. They didn't look at it. They were, they were postponing their work. You know, they, they weren't able to get around to it. So that was like terrifying. You know, I could have gotten fired for that, you know, cause that was just a breach of confidentiality and it was just terrible. It was humiliating. It was shameful. And it, it could have been tragic for, for my job as well. Um, but I was saved from that. I was not put to shame and the people who received it, they weren't shamed in seeing that information either because it would have had a bigger impact than just me alone. And then another time at work, um, I was asked to cover for like a, a boss and I really didn't know. I'd never been to this particular meeting that I was sent to. I'd never been to it before, but there was like this really mean vice president there and he just loved to humiliate people. And you would just hear stories every week. You would hear a story about who got humiliated in this meeting. And I was completely unprepared because, first of all, I'd never been to this meeting. Second of all, I had to cover material that I didn't know, you know that I didn't know that much about, you know, because I was just acting for somebody. So I just said, you know, I declare in Jesus name, I believe in Jesus and Jesus was put to shame for me, so I will not be put to shame. So I declare in Jesus' name, I will go to this meeting. I will not be put to shame. All will go well, and so be it in the name of Jesus. And thank you, Jesus, that you suffered shame, so I will not be put to shame. Okay, so I get to the meeting, and there was um, the guy who went before me. They were just picking him apart, and they just harassed him, asked him all kinds of questions, and just really just gave him a hard time and, and really they put him to shame. And I'm like, okay, here we go. And so then it was my turn. And so I did my little, my quick little presentation. And then they asked me a few gentle, easy questions. I answered them, boom. And, and it was just easy. So the, the guy who went before me was figuratively, he was crucified. And then, then me, they were just throwing these slow underhand softball pitches and I could boom, just knock it out of the park. And that was all God, you know, because, you know, I, I wasn't prepared. I didn't know this material yet. The guy who went before me, he knew his content much better than I knew mine, but God saved me because Jesus was put to shame for me. And so you can see how I took this scripture and just applied it to ordinary life. And you can do the same thing, whether in any aspect of life, if there's any opportunity for shame that rises in your life, Remember, Jesus was put to shame, so you never have to be put to shame. No matter whether it's a big thing, a little thing, you don't have to endure shame. Jesus endured it for you. Amen? All right, let's do a time check. Okay, we're doing good. So thank you, Jesus, for saving us from shame. Okay, so this will be the last... Um, last topical page, and then we'll look at a summary page after this one. Okay, so on this page, again, you're just going to see more of the same thing. You know, Jesus suffered something, so we're free from something. Jesus suffered poverty, so we are free from it. Um, Jesus suffered lack, so we are free from it. Jesus suffered hunger, so we are free from it. Jesus endured temptation, so we have a way out of temptation. And then you can just take this concept into all of your Bible reading, whenever you read and Jesus suffered or endured something, there is a benefit for you. What is it? And just lay hold of it. Okay. So in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Okay. And I want to pair together with that 2 Corinthians chapter 9. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give 
as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Okay, so first of all, Jesus, what did he suffer? He was rich, yet for us, he became poor, so that we, through his poverty, might become rich. Okay, so there's the mechanism. Jesus suffered something, he became poor, and through his poverty, we are made rich. Okay, so what does is, what is Bible rich mean? It's not greedy American rich. Um, Bible rich is described in chapter 9. Bible rich is that we always have, like always, that we always have all sufficiency in all things so that we may have an abundance for every good work. Okay, so Jesus suffered poverty. Through his poverty, we um, are made rich. And a rich person is someone who never lacks anything. A rich person never lacks anything. A rich person always has all of their needs fulfilled and they have extra leftover. That is the Bible definition of rich. And the extra leftover is so we can have an abundance of good work. Amen? So Jesus paid for that. He suffered poverty. And through his poverty, we are made rich. And therefore, we will never lack any good thing. And just, it says, always and all and all things. We will always have all sufficiency in all things with extra leftover. So you can elaborate on this. It could be money. It could be food. It could be shelter. It could be transportation. It could be clothes. You know, any aspect of life, anything that you could ever need in life, you are always to have sufficiency in that area. You are always to have all of your needs fulfilled in that area, in every area of life. And you are always to have extra left over to enable good works. Amen? That is what Jesus paid for. So we want to lay hold of that. Okay? Then if we switch topics to the area of temptation, uh, hunger and temptation. So in Matthew chapter 4 and also in Luke chapter 4, you can see the temptation of Jesus by the devil. So then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Okay, so... Here we can see that you know, Jesus was tempted. Um, he suffered hunger for 40 days, and he was extremely hungry, hungry afterward. And, and, yet, um, and yet he also did not bow down to the temptations of the devil. Okay, so anytime Jesus suffered something, there's a benefit. So if Jesus suffered hunger, then guess what? Then you shall be free from hunger. Well, but Bobby, it doesn't say you'll be free from hunger. It does. It says you will always have all sufficiency in all things. And that you will have an abundance for every good work. So if Jesus suffered hunger, if Jesus suffered poverty, then you will never suffer hunger and you will never suffer poverty. That's what you are entitled to. You are redeemed from poverty. You're redeemed from hunger. And in fact, um, let's go on here. In Philippians 4.19, it says, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So again, Jesus suffered a portfolio of things and, be, and by way of his suffering, all of your needs are always to be fulfilled. My God, Father God, shall supply all of your needs. It doesn't matter what it is. All of your needs by Jesus. Amen? Jesus suffered. We get the benefit. Thank you, Jesus. Okay? And, you know, Jesus suffered all kinds of temptation. You know, in particular, there was the temptations outlined in Matthew um, 4 and Luke 4. But there were even other temptations than that. And as a result of that, we get a benefit that we see in Hebrews 2, 17 and 18. Therefore, in all things, Jesus had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Okay, and let me combine with that 1 Corinthians 10, 13. 
No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to, to bear it or to endure it without succumbing. Okay, so Jesus suffered temptation. He did not succumb to it, and therefore Jesus is able to help those who are being tempted. And the help that we get, um, you know, one aspect of help would be self-control. Um, the other aspect would be God makes a way out of any temptation we can find ourselves in. There's, there is an exit door. Amen. God has provided an exit door out of every temptation. And that way we're not going to succumb to it. We have the opportunity not to succumb to it. If we will leverage the self-control fruit of the spirit, um, if we'll leverage that, and if we will ask God, show me the way I'm in a bad situation. I'm tempted to do this this terrible thing, show me the way out, and God will show you the way of escape. Amen? He promised. With the temptation, he will also make the way of escape. There's always a way out of a temptation that you might find yourself in. So ask God, show me the exit from this thing, because I am really tempted to do this bad thing. Don't let me do it. Open the door. Where's the door? And he will open the door and show you where the door is, and you can escape, and you will not bow down to the devil. Amen. So again, everything that we're, we're looking at a concept on this page that every time you find in the Bible, Jesus suffered something, Jesus endured something, there is a benefit for you. What is that benefit? And we want to lay hold of all these things that he did and just be, be stronger in our salvation, experience more benefit from him. God wants us to have these benefits. Jesus paid for these benefits. So let us learn everything Jesus did and, and just maximize what we receive from him because Jesus paid a dear price and we want to capitalize upon that to honor him and for our benefit and also to be a testimony to all the people around us who observe the amazing life that we have walking above problems. Amen? Okay, so the last page here, um, we're going to, read through this. So this is a summary. So we've had five teachings on redemption, and there's all these different things that we're redeemed from. Okay, so our redemption, our full salvation, it's huge. So let's just read through this, and then we'll wrap up. So in the first teaching, we saw that we are redeemed from the kingdom of darkness. We're redeemed from Satan's authority. We're redeemed from his tyrannical rulership, his lordship, his godship. So we are, re we are redeemed, we are ransomed, we are rescued from the devil and his rule and reign. We are redeemed from sin and sinful nature. We are redeemed from punishments and consequences of sin, and God will never punish us. Jesus bore all punishment. He bore the consequences for us, so we shall never be punished by God. We are redeemed from spiritual death in this life. Spiritual death, that by definition, spiritual death is when you're separated from God. And when you're separated from God, you are hopeless, you are depressed, you have fear, you have anxiety, you don't have God's help in life, so life doesn't go so well. Okay, so that's being spiritually dead in this life is not a good thing. Um, we are redeemed from spiritual death beyond this life, which would be, you know, if, if you didn't know God and you died, you would go to Hades unless Jesus were to intervene. Um, Hades is where a spirit goes who is not connected to God. And so we don't want to go into this pit of darkness. Okay, And so we are redeemed from that. In the second teaching, we saw that we are redeemed from the law. And we saw that the law is the ministry of death and condemnation that's against us. So we are, we are rescued from the law. The, the law is against us. The law is not for us. And it was even called by the Holy Spirit, the law is called the ministry of death. So we don't want anything to do with the ministry of death. We are redeemed from marriage to the devil, the God of this world. When we come, um, when we get born again, the Bible says that we are married to another, to Christ. And so if you were, if you're becoming married to another, when you're born again and you're married to Christ, then you were married to someone else, an evil one beforehand. Okay. So when you're born again, you become married to another, you become married to Christ. We saw that we have been redeemed from sinful passion, um, which is aroused by the law, which bears fruit to death. So we are redeemed from that. We are redeemed from the law, which was said to be weak and unprofitable 
and unable to perfect anything. We are redeemed from that. We are redeemed from all the rituals of the law. And here's where you'll have, you know, don't eat this. You can eat that. Don't, don't drink this. Don't drink that. Um, all the festivals, new moons, Sabbaths, all the rules around don't touch this, don't eat that. Uh, all that stuff, we are redeemed from it. None of that has anything to do with us. Okay? We are redeemed from law which separates and estranges us from God. So remember the Bible says that when you when you go under the law, Christ will profit you nothing. Okay, so you the law cuts you off from God. Okay, so we don't want to be cut off from God. We want to come to Jesus. We want to have nothing to do with the law. Don't you don't want to get entangled in any of these like Hebrew roots movements and churches that are, are involved in Old Testament rituals and celebrations and things like that. You need to stay completely away from that. Because when you go under the law, Christ will profit you nothing. And the Bible says you have fallen from grace. You have been estranged from God. And that is not a good condition. All right. Well, the law it was also the law was also called a yoke, a bondage. So we are redeemed from the bondage of being under the law. And of course, um, super importantly, we are redeemed from all the evil curses of the law. And there's just a huge list that we looked at of, you know, an entire page as big as this filled with curses that we are redeemed from. Okay, so that's good news. So we've been redeemed from the devil's kingdom and the devil likes to rule and reign with evil curses. And we are free from that. So we want to be familiar with the list of curses and make sure that we don't allow those things to arise in our lives because we are entitled to be free from any of those curses, we are entitled to be free from those issues all the days of our life because Jesus fulfilled the law and bore the curse for us. So we are free from law and we are free from curse. So thank you, Jesus. Okay, on the third teaching, we saw that we are redeemed from physical and mental sickness. We're redeemed from pain. We're redeemed from spirits of infirmity. We're redeemed from punishment and death. We're redeemed from being crushed or beaten uh, for our sins. And instead of receiving punishment and all these things, instead of that, we have peace. Jesus paid for us to have peace. We are also redeemed from sinful nature, and we receive a righteous nature. And then last time in session four, we saw that we are redeemed from enemies, and we are redeemed from every evil work. And that entitles us um, to preservation salvation. So we are entitled to walk in this life untouched by evil. Preservation, salvation belongs to us. And so we need to know it, believe it, and confess it, and then resist the devil and make him flee if he tries to bring something on us. We are redeemed from any um, past uh, transgressions, law breakings. We're redeemed from iniquity, sin. We're redeemed from death, redeemed from punishment. Instead of all that stuff, we have mercy, we have peace, and we have victory in life. We're redeemed from fear and torment. And instead, um, to replace that, we have the love of God. We're redeemed from the bondage of the law, and instead we have freedom. Okay, And then today we saw that we're redeemed from law, from sins and transgressions. We're redeemed from sacrifices. We're redeemed from a defiled conscience, which would be remembrance of sins and shame and guilt associated with it. We're redeemed from sinful nature, so therefore we can live holy and should live holy, and we are to be abounding in good works. We're redeemed from being put to shame, and we're redeemed from poverty, lack, and hunger, and we are delivered from temptation, and there's always a promised exit from every temptation. Okay, and I believe this is this is a good list, but it's probably still partial in nature. There's probably other things that I didn't capture. So just always remember, when you read the Bible, look for things that Jesus suffered, and there's going to be a benefit for you. Amen? All right, so that wraps up the teaching. So any comments or questions?